If you would like to be opening to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that will be the first text we look at tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We often use a phrase, I use a phrase too, about someone being spiritually minded. You may have said that or heard me say it or heard someone else say it before. It might surprise you to know that the word spiritually minded is not in the Bible. It's not put together. I know minded's in there, spiritual's in there, but what I'm saying is, is there's not a verse you go to that says this person is spiritually minded. It is certainly a concept, though, that's in the Scripture, and that's what I want to discuss this evening, as to who would be a person who would be spiritually minded, and that's what I want to look at. We might want to come up with some ideas about that, if, since we now know that it's not a term that's used in the Bible, as to what a person who's spiritually minded might be. We might come up with some things uh, like this. Well, they're a very religious person. And we would think of a religious person, probably, as being spiritually minded. So if that would be you, and you define it that way, that would be one way that that would be something we might discuss. We might think of someone like a monk, someone that's ex secluded in themselves, remove themselves from society, and therefore they've just become very focused on something, and therefore they are spiritually minded. Maybe it's not that one, and we think, well, no, somebody spiritually minded is somebody that just really knows the Bible. They can quote book, chapter, verse, and they just have a really good concept of the Bible as far as the text goes, and that's someone that's spiritually minded. Or maybe we may just say, I just know the person, and I know their character, and I know their reputation. And because of that, I view them as a very spiritual person or spiritually minded. Maybe they're a member of a local church. And that's something that every time the doors are open, they are there and they're in attendance. And because of that, we view that and equate that to being spiritually minded. You know, we could come up with all kinds of different things. And we could have a rap session about it, and I could step down here a little closer to you. We could go around the room and say, what do you think spiritually minded? What do you think spiritually minded? And have a little fun with it. But that wouldn't actually benefit us a whole lot. I want to instead, obviously, look at what the Scripture says about someone who would be spiritually minded, even though we're not going to find that term. We're going to find three different occasions in the New Testament to where a person is described as being spiritual. And I want to equate that and learn from that particular lesson. As you look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and in verse 14, you will find the first example of this. It says, <clears throat> A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. And so the spiritual person is defined here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. We've got 14, really it should be 14 and 15 there on that particular slide. But what you see here in the text is this person has some spiritual aspect to them. Well, what is it? Well, back up in the context, if you will, to verse 10. It says, For to us God revealed them through the Scripture. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of, man, uh, thoughts of God, excuse me, no one knows except the spirit of God. I want to just note as we read through here, you see this word that starts to show up. And it's in verse 10, and we're going to find it as well just a little bit later uh, in, in the text. But it says, for to us. So he's talking to a specific group of people in defining this. And so he says in verse 12, Now we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is of God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Things, uh, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Or you might not have words and thoughts there. It might just say combining spiritual with spiritual. In verse 16 it says, For him who has known the mind of God, that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So you've got this us and we throughout the text. Who is talking about and who is describing here? It's not the Corinthians. It's the speakers, the ones who are doing this speaking and doing this teaching. They have a revelation, and they're speaking that revelation and teaching that revelation to these people. So verse 13, it says, Which things we also speak, 
Not in words taught by human wisdom, but those, uh, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual with spiritual. And so now, he describes someone in verses 14 and 15. In verse 14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand it because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. So he has a spiritual person here who's judging certain things. And that is they value certain things. That's what he means. They put a certain value on the things that are being taught. In contrast in the text, he is describing a natural man to a spiritual man. That's the context comparison between the two. The natural person or the natural man in the context judges or appraises things on the basis of tradition and on the basis of experience, human wisdom, and human philosophy. The spiritual man on the other side of the coin, though, he judges or appraises things on the basis of his, it was revealed by the Spirit of Almighty God. And therefore, it's reliable. You can take the things that have been revealed through the Spirit of God and notice the difference between the two. If it's revealed by the Spirit of God, by the thoughts of God, by the mind of God here in this text, then it's very valuable in faith and in practice and in service then to the Lord. Let's expand the context just a little bit to get some specifics. Go back up to verse uh, 6. Verse 6 in the text. He says, Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. So you can see that these things that are being talked about are being expressed by someone who has a, a right to express them. They are prophesying things that are spoken by a prophet. He says, we speak, things, uh, we speak God's wisdom, excuse me, in a mystery, verse 7, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Verse 8, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. So he's saying... We have wisdom that we're speaking, and there are, there's, a, there's a contrast here in the way that it's viewed. Some people listen to this wisdom that's being spoken, and they see no value in it. They think it's foolishness. And so they just judge it, and they throw it away. That's the natural man in the context. But this wisdom that he's talking about is different. Well, what's wisdom? I know to expand upon this context even more, we, it, we see the idea of wisdom and what he's talking about, but it's not what we might commonly consider wisdom when we're studying the Scripture. We might think wisdom, Proverbs. Proverbs would be a good place to go and get some wisdom, or Ecclesiastes. But that's not what he's talking about here. Pick up back in verse 8. He says, The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The wisdom he's talking about here is in direct connection with the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, his crucifixion. Verse 9, but just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So the crucifixion of the Lord in glory, that is, God gave to men what they could not possibly conceive. The depths and the heights of this wisdom. They couldn't envision a plan like what God put in place by themselves. It had to be revealed to them. Go back a little bit further and expand the context. Chapter 1 and verse 18. <clears throat> Chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, For the word of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So you understand here from this context that the cross is put for the crucifixion of the Messiah, and, and that is the death of Messiah, a suffering Messiah, and the natural man, in this context in Corinth, the way he's writing, these are Gentile philosophers, Greek in, in, their, in their knowledge and the way they viewed society, and the Jew with his prejudice, he, he encompasses all those together. They look at a suffering Messiah, a crucified Messiah, and they say, I don't want to accept that. That's not what they want. That's not what they're giving it to. And in contrast, you have the spiritual man. 
who looks at that, looks at the revealed word, and he appreciates it. He appraises it that way or judges it that way, that it's been given and confirmed that it's the power of God. Keep going, chapter 1, verse 22. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. They weren't looking for Christ crucified. The Jew wasn't looking for a suffering Messiah. They weren't interested in the cross. They're not interested in a message about salvation from sin. They want salvation, all right, but they want salvation from taxes. They want salvation from the Roman oppression that they were undergoing. And so the idea of what they were wanting compared to what they were given from God and what was promised from God was foolishness to them. The idea of a Savior and a Redeemer is just a stumbling block is the way that it's described here. And the Jews were that way, but the Greeks just thought it was foolishness just the same. Because they would have not been taught this in their universities. Greek philosophy would not have taught that you need a Messiah to come and die on the cross for you to have this salvation, to have a relationship with God. So it's a bunch of foolishness to all of them. They don't value the gospel message of the cross, the suffering Messiah, the crucified Messiah. Look at verse 24. He says, those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. See, this is God's wisdom being shown through. Verse 30. But by doing, by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, that Him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. The spiritual man, or the spiritually minded person, if you will, is one who understands the gospel of the cross. They understand the gospel message of the suffering Messiah. They understand their need for it. And they judge that as the most valuable thing they've ever learned, the most valuable thing that they've ever heard. They run to it. They flee to it for salvation. They flee to it for righteousness. They flee to it for redemption. They flee to it for hope. And they don't boast in themselves. They boast in the fact that Christ died for them on the cross. That their sins can be taken away from the suffering Messiah. That is the spiritually minded person in the context of chapter 2 and in verse 14. There are people alive today who believe that Jesus died on the cross and believe that He rose again for the sins of mankind that aren't spiritual by this context. The reason being, it's not valuable to them. That's not valuable to believe that the Holy Spirit revealed the mind of God to them, but because it's already been determined in their mind. It's maybe what they've taught by their parents or grandparents or family tradition and those sort of things. That's not the case in the context. They didn't have any tradition of that at the time. This is being taught to them at the time. But, but as time goes on and we teach our kids or our grandkids or great-grandkids, if we're not careful, it can become out of a habit that we are making little Christians, if you will. But the spiritually-minded person recognizes the weight of that truth, the weight of the revealed Word, the weight of the promise of God, and the weight of the crucified Messiah and they accept it not because their parents told them it was true or their grandparents did, but because it was revealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Chapter 2 and verse 4 says this, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith will not rest in the wisdom of, God, uh, wisdom of men, but on the power of God. The spiritual person in the context doesn't go about believing it because somebody's told them this and it's been passed down from generation to generation. They don't believe it because it's the religion of America. And people say America is a Christian country. That's not the reason that they believe it. They're a spiritual person based upon the fact that they've seen it, they've heard it, and it's been verified as truth as coming from the Almighty God. I mean, can you imagine it? Paul shows up to Corinth. He's a preacher. You've never heard of him. And he shows up and he starts preaching. And he may or may not be very good with words. I can't tell whether he's being sarcastic or not when he says that he's not a good speaker. 
But he doesn't have any credentials. And uh, as far as they would view it, he doesn't have a university degree in it or something like that to, to allow him to preach the gospel or something of that nature. But he comes and he proclaims this message. And you listen to the message and you go, well, how do I know whether or not this message is true? How do I, I know whether or not I can put my faith in it? Well, he verifies it. The Holy Spirit verifies it with the miracles that are produced. You know, some people in Corinth that lived in the city were rich, had a lot of things monetarily. They were renowned. And yet there's an indication in chapter 1 that that wasn't the people who accepted the gospel message that was preached. But they would view themselves in a certain way and society may agree with them being rich and wealthy, but it was those people that recognized something else about themselves. They recognized that they needed this. They recognized that there was sin and a debt that they could not pay, that they were guilty of, and they were going to stand before God condemned, and they have a way to have their debt paid, their debt forgiven, their debt removed through this suffering Messiah, and it's been verified as true by the Holy Spirit, and it's right there before you, and there's salvation available, and all you have to do is reach out and grab it. And recognize the great message that it is. And that's people that are just accepting the gospel naturally. Not because of tradition or whatever it might be. But they're recognizing that they have a need. And the only way to satisfy that need is in the suffering Messiah. Is in the cross. And so there will be plenty of people who would come and say, Well, yeah, Jesus is the, the Christ. Yeah, He died and yeah, He rose on the third day. And you say, are you willing to give your life to Him? Are you willing to devote your life in service to Him forevermore? Are you willing to be baptized for the remission of sins? And sometimes people will say, no. Well, why not? Because that's not what I've been taught through tradition of the years that I need to do. But a person that's spiritually minded will look at it differently. They will look at it as the most valuable thing ever that God offered this salvation through the Messiah. And they'll be willing to do whatever He demands of them. That's what the people did in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. That's what Paul did in Acts 22 and in verse 16. They're judging the things based upon divine revelation, on, not on the basis of family tradition or, or religion or what my preacher says or what my favorite preacher says or whatever it might be. Not judging it on any of that. We're judging it on it's a divine revelation from God. And it tells me what's right. And it tells me what is not right. Right. And the spiritual person will take value in that. They will appreciate that. And that's what he's talking about here in this text as he discusses the superiority of God's wisdom to that of the natural man. A spiritually minded person will recognize that. If you keep going in 1 Corinthians over to chapter 14 now, you'll find the second instance of this uh, phrased and used in this way. <clears throat> and you know, it would be really easy. I've got a definition up there. And it would be really easy to say that's what we just spent 15 minutes discussing that. I did. And, you know, we could just take that and just input that definition here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And, and we could just assume that that's what it means. But that would be a lazy Bible student. And in this case, it would be wrong. It's important for us to recognize the context each time we see an idea and each time we see a word or phrase to let the context dictate to us what is being talked about and not just input certain things from certain places. And so, when you get to chapter 14, there's a new context. They had spiritual gifts then. We talked a little bit about this this morning. And so, chapter 14, he's regulating these spiritual gifts and he tells them how the how to exercise them when they were assembled together and they had some things that they were going to have to be considering of that they probably didn't like. For example, if you had the spiritual gift to speak in tongues, that's a language of which you hadn't been taught and there wasn't an interpreter, he tells you to sit down and be quiet. They probably wouldn't like that if you had this gift. You'd say, I want to exercise my gift. So what? No interpreter? Sit down. Be quiet. He tells them you only got to have one person speaking at a time. We can't have confusion. And they say, but I have this gift of prophecy. Well, so what? Somebody else does. Let's just talk over one another. He regulates just before this text we're going to look at in verse 37, he regulates women's role in the assembly. And he, and he is exclusive in what he says about their role is to be there and not addressing the assembly. And a number of things that he says 
that would not be popular to them any more popular than they would be today. But notice this in verse 37. He says, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, there's our term, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandments. So you have a spiritual person here, and what they recognize, he defines right in the text, they recognize, hey, these things that Paul's writing are apostolic writings with authority. These things come in the same way of which what the Lord says His commandments are. He has the right to say it. And a spiritual person looks at them and agrees to them on the basis of not how great Paul is, but on the fact that he was an ambassador of God. And so a spiritual person recognizes that. Notice verse 38. He says, But if anyone does not recognize this, He's not recognized. Well, that's really interesting. What, what does he mean by that? It, it's, it's kind of even more unique that it, some translations will put this, and you'll have some footnotes here that maybe help you with this sometime. It, it says if, if a person's ignorant, let, let him be ignorant. A harsh way to say it. If he's ignorant on this subject, he's not recognizing the truth that's revealed in this word. A prophet in this case, if he's a prophet and he doesn't recognize the things which Paul's writing are the commandments of God, then don't recognize him. He's, if he's ignorant, let him be ignorant. That's a pretty strong statement in the way that he says it there. So the spiritual man here in this context is not one that just simply has these spiritual gifts. It's not necessarily one that's the most talented man, but he's a person that bows his head, bows his knee to God, and recognizes what does God say about Fill in the blank after that. That's the way it's being described here. We're, we're sitting here looking through these scriptures. We've looked at these two scriptures so far. And we're trying to define what a spiritually minded person is or a spiritual person is. And it would be great for us to kind of go around and talk about it for a minute. But that wouldn't do us any good. That's the point that we're seeing. What value is in the scripture to define these things? The spiritual man in the context will simply go, what does God say about it? And I'm going to yield myself to that. The third one we find is in Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5, and it goes through actually chapter 6. I put all of Galatians 5 there basically, but I really I, I want to focus on the end of, of the text because we're going to actually find this in chapter 6 in verse 1, but you know that the chapter breaks weren't there originally. It's just put there to kind of help guide us as we read through. So Galatians 5, verse 25. Start there at the end of the chapter. It says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another, brethren. Even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, there's our term again, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Now then, we've got a third way of defining scripture, uh, spiritual here in the scriptures and what he's saying here. This is a person who not just looks at their life and their attitude and their, and, and their speech and their heart and, and tries to align it with what's considered right by society, but they look at those things and they say, what does the Spirit say about this? Look back, if you will, in this text, chapter 5, verse 19. He's having a discussion here about two different, two different columns, if you were going to make columns. He says, The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, and he keeps going through that. So he's, he's discussing deeds of the flesh, and he's discussing this fruit of the Spirit. In verse 16, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So really... Before he gets into deeds of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit, he's talking about this war that's going on. This war between flesh and spirit. And in verse 19, he talks about those who are governed by the flesh. The type of decisions they make based upon the flesh and fleshly mindset. And in verse 22, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. He's defining for them the one who would focus their mind upon what the Spirit wants them to focus on. 
A spiritual man walks by the Spirit. They're exhibiting this fruit of the Spirit. So, you've got this guy. Let's let just use for an example. And he knows his Bible. He may teach the divine pattern. He may be really good at bringing an exposition of the Word of God before others. He appreciates the cross. But back up here in verse 19, he is committing immorality. Or his language is filthy. Or he's guilty of strife or jealousy or outburst of anger. Any of these that are listed here in this text. But he knows his Bible. He can teach the Bible. He believes in Christ. Is he spiritual? Not in this text. Not spiritually minded in the way that it's defined here. The spiritual man has the fruit of the Spirit because he's walking by the Spirit. That is the Spirit's instruction. I didn't say he was perfect. I just said he's not focusing on what he ought to be focusing on as is outlined in the text. Look at chapter 6 and verse 7. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And note chapter 6 and verse 1. This spiritual man is trying to restore others. You see a brother who's caught in a trespass and you're spiritual. You're walking by the Spirit. You're living by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. You're trying to consider others. And you're trying to do it in the right way. Way. Notice in verse 1 he says, In a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Well, why do you need to go talking to people that are caught in a trespass and need to be talking to them gently? Well, it may get a little confrontational. Certainly will be uncomfortable. And people may not always take it well. But he includes something else there too. It may be you the next time. And so the spiritual man is one who gets to make up their mind. Here's how I'm going to live. Here's how I'm going to walk. Here are the choices that I'm going to be making. They are in perfect alignment with what God wants me to do. I'm, I may misstep, but I am focused on what does God want me to do in my life. What fruit of the Spirit am I exhibiting? And it better be this that he's defined here in this text. So just three texts to look at it this evening, and you're probably thinking, well, he's about to wrap this up. Oh, no, don't worry, I've got a few more slides. This defines a spiritual person, in my estimation, by the Scripture. If you're spiritually minded and you're looking for three Scriptures for it, these are the three. I'm not aware of any others, but please let me know if you find others so that I can adjust this. I'll preach it again next Sunday evening. I mentioned some things at the beginning of the lesson <clears throat> that we may think of when we think of someone who's spiritually minded. I want to talk about those for just a couple of minutes. And what actually the spiritual person is not. The first one's in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. These are verses that talk about folks and certain characteristics and certain you know, situations that we might put under the umbrella of spiritual or spiritually minded but they're actually not. And they're going to become self-evident pretty quickly here in these texts. So Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to Athens to preach and he goes into the Areopagus and he says to them in, in verse 22, he stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all aspects. You see the way he puts that? Very religious. He said, I, I see you as very religious. Do they serve God? Do they believe Jesus is the Christ? No, not in any case of that. But what he does see here is this idea of they are very religious. Simply being religious does not equate to being spiritually minded. They're religious people. They expend money on things that would be uh, religious, on idols. They built all these idols and temples as he's walking around looking through there. And, and they are very religious in those regards, but they're not spiritually minded in the way that he's talking about in these three other verses. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 4, please. 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 4. And you'll notice another situation here. Some say... You know, you can be spiritually minded and being so spiritually minded is equated with then, uh, you know, 
denying yourself things. In this text, 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 3, it says, Men who forbid marriage advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully sh uh, shared by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it was received with gratitude. The things which they're denying here in the text were actually okay. They were a lawful pleasure that one could be partaking in. Maybe it's, well, I'm so spiritually minded, I'm not going to get married. Well, in, in the case of what's allowed by God, there may be nothing wrong with that. But just saying I'm going to deny myself some sort of pleasure, some sort of legal, if you will, lawful pleasures from God, doesn't make me a spiritual person just because I deny myself certain pleasures. The next one's in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. 1 John 2 and verse 3. It says, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word, in Him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. So here's a person that says, I know Him. I know God. I've got knowledge, maybe at least claims to, but because a person claims to be knowledgeable does not mean that one is spiritually minded. Just to claim that that's the case doesn't equate to being spiritual. You can know the Bible, you can quote it, you can maybe engage in religious debates, but do you live by the commandments of which God has put in place? Just being knowledgeable and just claiming to have knowledge doesn't equate with being spiritual. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, a few verses I want to look at here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's start in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 13. It says, For such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, distinguishing themselves as apostles of Christ. And, and he says in verse 14, No wonder for even Satan disguises himself uh, it, it, as it disguises himself, excuse me, as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Now, if you were to ask the people at Corinth, tell me about Paul. What, what would you say about him? Well, they would think of Paul, and they actually thought negatively of him in this case. They were thinking he really wasn't an apostle. They were talking against him, and he's giving proof that he was. Do you think he's spiritual? They would have said no, but the reason is they don't understand what spiritual means in that, in that particular way. Look at verse 19. He says, For you being so wise, tolerate the foolish gladly. It's not a, a pat on their back that he's telling them. He said, you, you are being so, you so smart. Yet these foolishness, you tolerate it. For you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face. These guys, these guys are going, oh, they think they're so great. They think they're so wonderful. They're taking advantage of you. They're misusing you. But they think they're so great. And he's telling them shame on you. Just because someone thinks you're great, just because someone thinks you're spiritual, does not mean you are spiritual. You know, they had spiritual gifts. We saw that back in 1 Corinthians. And when you got to 1 Corinthians, like chapter 3 mentions that in chapter 3 and verse 1, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, he, he talks to them. He says, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual men, but as a flesh, as to infants in Christ. You know, they, they had spiritual gifts. They had all kinds of reasons not to be carnally minded. And yet they were you even had this situation in chapter 5 and in verse 1 where it's reported there was immorality among you. Immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. Someone has his father's wife. You've become arrogant, not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed will be removed from your midst. He is a member there in the congregation with them. But just being a member does not equate to being spiritual. Remember the local church, he's saying here that they needed to be kicked out, if you will. He needed to be disciplined in that particular case. 
So where does it all come home to us? What's the point for us? How can we take a lesson from what's spiritual and what's not spiritual? Well, there's a, a few final thoughts I want to give you. One is to be careful how you judge others. And be careful how you judge yourself. The idea in Matthew chapter 7 as Jesus is preaching there is this idea of discerning, being a discerning judge. And don't just accept what other people say about you. There may be those that are speaking falsely. In John chapter 7 and in verse 23 and 24, in John 7 and verse 23, 24, it says, If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The idea that he's giving here is you need to be really careful as to how you esteem yourself, and you need to be really careful as to how you esteem others. Use God's standard for judgment to determine whether or not I'm spiritual, you're spiritual, anybody's spiritual. Utilize God's Word to help in defining that. Let's close with Romans chapter 8, if you will. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, and this is the why we care. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. Romans 8 and verse 5. There Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, For those who are according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. The apostolic writing, the moral and spiritual life of which we live is what life and peace is. It's that life and peace because of what he says in the context. Just back up to verse 24 of chapter 7. He says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the, uh, from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind and serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. If I set my mind on where it ought to be, if I will focus my life on where God wants it to be focused, I don't have to carry around the burden of sin. I can be set free from that burden through Christ and sacrifice in God's will. There's no condemnation because my trust is in Christ Jesus. So, let's just be sure we define things as God wants us to. Try to do things that God wants us to. To do the things the Spirit wants me to do. And measure those things by His pattern and His desire. Thank you for the good attention this evening. I pray the study, it, it, to me, it's, it's more like a Bible class, if you will, where you don't get to talk. Just a good study to go through and define these things in the text. May they be an encouragement to you as you continue serving the Lord. If we can help you publicly in that this evening, we want to take advantage of the opportunity afforded to us while the good brethren are gathered here. If we can assist you in your service to the Lord this evening, let us know as we stand together and as we sing.